ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, Game of Thrones, The Rise of David. In this series, we look at how God removed Saul from the throne and took David, a simple shepherd boy, and made him the king of Israel. This week's text, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 17. We're going to be looking at the story of David and Goliath. I'm calling it the shepherd warrior. Rather than reading the entire chapter, since we no longer live in a time when nobody has Bibles, uh, I assume you can have yours and you can read uh, the chapter. I'm just going to read verses 41 to 47. Uh, I'll be reading out of the New International Version. As always, everything will be up on the screen, but I encourage you to bring a Bible uh, or use your version or something else on your iPad or iPhone so you can kind of follow along uh, as we look through the text. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 41. Hear the words of the sovereign God. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. A couple of years ago, uh, Linda and I got to take a trip to Italy. We were celebrating our 30th anniversary, and we saw the most amazing architecture and sites uh, and paintings and statues we also saw how great Michelangelo was because the greatest architecture we saw was done by Michelangelo. The greatest painting we saw, the Sistine Chapel, was done by Michelangelo. And the three greatest statues, by general agreement, that we saw were all done by Michelangelo. The Pieta, uh, uh, which was Jesus uh, after his death in Mary's lap, being cradled by Mary, was the first major statue he did. His Moses was at St. Peter's in Chains, which was fantastic. But my favorite was the David. And here's a picture of it from our trip there, the David up in Florence. And this statue was meant to capture uh, David as he was going into battle with Goliath. And it's impossible to grasp what it was like to stand there. I could have stood there and looked all day. We unfortunately didn't have time. My wife was glad for that. Um, but it's an unbelievable statue to walk around and to look at and to grasp that moment that Michelangelo was trying to capture. And he actually said it had been a, re a rejected piece of marble that another sculptor tried to use and said wasn't good enough. And Michelangelo took it and carved it out of this. And when he's asked how he did it, he said, I really didn't. God put David in the piece of stone. I just simply cleared everything else away. And you see the statue here, and it's a young David striding out to battle, and if you notice, he's got the slingshot strapped up over his left shoulder, and in his right hand, which his hand is actually out of proportion, it's oversized, and he's cradling a stone, and he is looking towards Goliath, and this is right before the battle with Goliath, and I want you to note the look on his face, and we're now, if you look in here, he is serene, he is confident, and in fact, he's so much so that some art people started saying afterwards, this has to be after the battle because he looks so confident. But they misunderstand what's going on. What Michelangelo was trying to capture was in the face of this fearsome warrior, this young man stood there and he's looking at Goliath and saying, your moments are numbered. There's no question. There's no fear. There is nothing but faith and confidence in God. And in doing this, Michelangelo has captured the greatest moment of one of the greatest men in all of Scripture. 
And that brings a question for us as we look at this. We saw last week David being anointed as king and the spirit coming upon him. And let me say, we're going to see in the coming weeks David not doing so well. We're going to see David where he doesn't look like this, but he's fleeing in fear and he's having all kinds of problems. But at this moment, David is full of faith. And it brings up the question, how does David do this? What's going on in David's life? And what does this teach us, not just regarding David, but how we walk before the Lord? And even more importantly, I always want to remind us, what does this have to do with the story moving forward? What does this tell us regarding Christ? Because it's all about Christ. Every text is teaching us something about Jesus. So what is going on? Well, we begin, let's take a look at Goliath and Saul. Before we move to Goliath and David, remember, Saul's the, still the king sitting on the throne, even though David has been anointed. And so we kind of have to deal with Goliath and Saul to move to Goliath and David because it's showing us the problems that are going on here. And so we begin by reading that the Philistines are preparing for war against Israel. If you look in verses 1 to 3, I won't read it all, but the Philistines have gathered their forces uh, in Judah and Basically what's happening is the Philistines are on one high piece of ground, the Israelites are on another high piece of ground, and there's a long valley that runs through them. The valley is still there to this day. It's a major valley. They're both occupying the high ground, which we're told in verse three, they occupy one hill, the Israelites another, and the valley's between them. Now the Philistines are Mycenaean Greeks, is what it appears to us today, which means they've come from probably even the island of Crete. And they're actually, in the book of Isaiah one time, they're actually, the word that's used for them is the word Helene, which means they're Greeks. Uh, they've come from there. They're the biggest enemies uh, of Israel at this time. And in fact, we're going to see as, as we read about Goliath, he very much fits the mold of a Greek warrior. And they're going to be clashing with Israel. Now, what happens, therefore, is, is the two armies are there. Goliath does what oftentimes happened with Greeks in battle at this time. It was not very well known in the area of the ancient Near East, but it was in Greek warfare, which was we're going to have a clash of champions. If you notice in verse 4 and then verses 8 and 9, we read that there's a, a champion named Goliath who's from Gath. Now, the word champion in Hebrew literally means one between the armies. So it's one person steps out between the two armies and Goliath strides out into the big valley and he starts shouting to Israel and he is calling out for them to send someone down. Notice in verse 8 we, we read he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are, are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man, have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So the idea was that these champions would fight, and if we all followed along, then only one person need die rather than having the armies do it. Now, the reality is it didn't usually work that way because if you killed my champion, I'd just say, yeah, I would have my fingers crossed. <laughs> We're still not doing that. We're not just going to give in. But, but it was an idea that they would try to have the two champions do this. And so Goliath strides out and does this, and, and Israel does later on adopt this policy. We kind of see this happen later on in their own history. But here's the big problem. It's not that it's this different kind of warfare. It's not that there's a champion arguing to do it. It's who the champion is. Because there is a problem for Saul. And that is that when you look at Goliath from the outside and you consider his height and his appearance, he is one scary dude. Notice what we read about him in verses 4 to 7. He's this champion named Goliath from Gath. He comes out. He's over nine feet tall, we're told, and he had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, and he had bronze greaves um, he, uh, on his legs, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels, and his shield bearer went ahead of him. Now, the Hebrew here actually says he's about nine feet tall. It gives it in cubits. It says it was six cubits in a span, the length from your elbow up to your hand, and then the hand again. So he was nine to nine and a half feet tall. Interestingly enough, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, said he was six and a half feet tall, and so did Josephus, and so did some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's some discrepancy there in the text whether he was six and a half or nine and a half feet tall, but either way, here's the point. 
This is a big, impressive dude. In those days, six and a half feet was a giant as well. And you can understand if you've ever traveled much, I know when I generally go to other countries, even at six foot three, I feel like Goliath walking around usually because I'm in a sea of people that hit me about the middle of my chest and you feel suddenly extremely large and tall. And that's the way Goliath looked. And it's interesting, this is the most detailed description of armor anywhere in the scripture, right here. Why are they telling us about all this armor? Because the point is how well armed and defended he is. He's got all of this metal armor and he's covered from head to toe and it is huge, heavy armor that he's got. And he's even got a shield bearer in front of him to carry a big, huge shield out there. In other words, this guy is impressive, he is scary, and he is seemingly impregnable. And we do, by the way, I should point out, we, we have examples of this kind of armor, and we even have bones of people throughout history that were up to nine and a half feet tall. There are, these are not unknown things. But the point that the scripture's getting to us is Goliath is huge. He is imposing. He is an awe-inspiring sight. The scripture wants us to see that when you consider Goliath's height and his appearance, it gives you fear because he seems to be unbeatable. No one would stand a chance against such a warrior. The largest Israelite we already know is King Saul. He's heads and shoulders above all the Israelites. And Saul is used to standing and looking down at other people and saying, I look at you and you are smaller and weaker than I am. But now Saul stands and he looks at a man and he says, there's no way I can fight this guy. There's no way I can fight Goliath. But the problem is, is Goliath keeps taunting Israel. Day after day, he comes out and he does this. And we read in verses 10 and 11, Goliath's taunt and Israel's response. We read that the Philistine, Goliath said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Goliath taunts Saul He's taunting Israel. You remember earlier, he'd said, you're, you're the servants of Saul. We all know who Saul is. He's fought, and Saul's won numerous battles against us. But here I stand, send somebody down. And Saul and the Israelites, however, are looking. And what they see and what they think when they consider his height and they consider his appearance is that we can't do it. They consider his height and they consider his appearance and their faith melts and fear seizes them. How can they possibly stand up against this guy? The most impressive Israelite, Saul, heads and shoulders bigger, looks. He considers his height. He considers his appearance, and he says, I cannot stand this, because Saul is now bereft of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the spirit, we were told at the end of the previous chapter, has left Saul. And therefore, Saul only has his own skills, his own abilities, and when he weighs them out against Goliath, he says, there's no way I can do this. Apart from the spirit, and God wants us to understand this, this is why God brings a Goliath along. Saul could defeat many problems and things in his own strength. But when God brings Goliath into the picture, there is no way for Saul or anyone else to serve and save the people of God apart from the Holy Spirit. If you are bereft of the Spirit, I do not care what other talents you may have, you cannot serve and you cannot save the people of God. Make a note of that and remember that because there's a lot of stuff going on in the name of the church today that is actually being done by people in the arm of the flesh, so to speak, not by the Spirit of God. And you can never do that. You can build a wonderful business. You can be a successful politician. You can be a great military leader. You cannot be a shepherd in God's flock. You cannot serve the kingdom of God apart from the Spirit of God. It cannot happen. We don't build the same way everybody else builds. It's a different 
kind of battle. And so Saul is left this way. And so Israel, all of them, including Saul to this point in the story, are looking at the situation not through the eyes of faith in God, but rather than trusting in their own abilities. And when you do that, let me tell you, God always has a way that Goliath is going to show up on the scene. And so Israel is left, and they are quaking in fear. So what's going to happen? Well, at this point, we meet God's champion. And God's champion is a young lad named David. God doesn't use a champion like Goliath. He brings David. And so we read in verses 11 and 12, and notice how we're getting this juxtaposition because it's about Saul and David at this point in the narrative. In verse 11, we read, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites are terrified. Now David, very next words in the Hebrew text. In Hebrew, it's actually just one word because they can combine the the conjunction and the word together, and that's exactly what they do. So you've read that they're terrified, but David. Now David is here on the scene. Saul is terrified, but now here is David. Israel is dismayed, but now here is David. Saul is terrified because he's bereft of the Holy Spirit, but now here is David, a man anointed in the power of the Holy Spirit who has come upon him. God has a champion. David the anointed will come and he will save God's people. Now, we need to understand who this David is and what we're learning from him. Remember, we, we never even saw David's name until chapter 16, verse 13. First time we ever meet David's name and it's when the spirit rushes upon him. What do we know about David as he's striding in this battle? Well, number one, we know he's anointed by the spirit to shepherd Israel. Remember chapter 16, verse 13. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him. We just know it's Jesse's youngest son at that point, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. First time we read David's name is the Holy Spirit is upon David in power. So there's a different situation when David stands in front of Goliath than when Saul and the rest of Israel does because the Spirit of Yahweh is upon David. Secondly, what we know is David seemed unimpressive to everyone around him. Remember chapter 16, when Samuel says, I'm here to anoint one of your sons, bring all of your sons before me, Do they, does Jesse bring all of his sons? No, he brings seven of them because everybody figured, well, it can't be David. I mean, he's the run of the litter. He's number eight. He's out taking care of the sheep. And you remember Samuel gets through all seven and is like, something's not right. God told me it's one of your sons, but he said it's none of these Oh, yeah, well, we, we've got the youngest. Remember, the, the Hebrew word means the insignificant one, the, the little one, the one that nobody pays attention to. He's out there with the sheep. And Samuel says, bring him back. And that's what we see about him. So we see that in chapter 16. Even David's own family thought that. Now, we might think at this point they've seen David anointed by the great prophet of God. The Holy Spirit has rushed upon David, so surely his family would view him differently, right? Well, no, they don't. When we... Look in verse 28 in this chapter, in 1728, we read this about David's oldest brother, Eliab. When when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking, David was asking questions with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now, If I were David, I might point out, and I'm not watching much of a battle because you're all over here wet in your tunics. So there's not much of a battle to watch. But David doesn't, but notice Eliab's thing here. What are you doing here? And who did you leave those few sheep with? You're, You're young, you're nothing, David. You just have a few sheep off in the desert. And I bet you just wandered off and you left them. False accusation number one. Number two, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. Really? Because Yahweh said he was going to choose the person in all Israel whose heart was after Yahweh. Kind of a problem for Eliab when your uh, description of David's heart and Yahweh's description of David's heart are polar opposites of one another. 
But that's the way Eliab views his brother. You're just down here like any other teenage kid. You heard there was going to be a battle. You dropped your responsibilities. Dad's sheep are probably wandering around the wilderness right down now. And you're just here running your mouth wanting to watch a battle. That's who you are, David. And it continues on. It's not just David's own family. Saul, who, remember, has seen David and had David play the harp so that Saul was delivered from an evil spirit. Surely he would see who David is, right? But he doesn't. When David appears before him and says, I'll go fight this guy, here's Saul's response in verse 33. You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You were only a boy, And he has been a fighting man from his youth. David, maybe your sight's not working, but this guy is a champion. This guy has been fighting longer than you've been alive. You are no match for him, David. You're just a boy. Now, again, David might say, a boy through whom the Spirit of Yahweh works to deliver you from an evil spirit, a boy whom God has called and anointed as king, but David doesn't say any of that. He just stands there. But notice how they're doing it. Now, not only is it David's whole family and Eliab specifically and Saul, when Goliath first sees David, notice what he says in verse 42. Goliath sees a young, handsome boy and despises him. He says he looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Goliath, who is probably scarred with uh, marks from older warfares, looks and sees a pristine young man, full, glowing with health, and he's sitting there, and Goliath doesn't think, oh, this guy is fresh and ready for battle. Goliath looks at him, and he despises him. You aren't even worth my time. I thought they were going to send somebody real out here for me to fight, and they sent a kid. That's the way Goliath looks at him. When others considered his height and his appearance, no one saw God's champion. Just a young man who's going to be killed by Goliath like that, and the battle will be over. Nobody saw David as a champion for God except God because God does not consider height and appearance God does not look at the things men look at. He looks at the heart. Thirdly, the David who is being presented to us is a David who is faithful in small things. Please hear this or you will misunderstand this passage. Notice in verse 20, and I can show several places where David does this. In verse 20, we read, Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded and set out as Jesse had directed. So contrary to what Eliab said, Jesse didn't just decide to go to the battle. He's been running back and forth between Saul and Jesse's sheep taking care of them. And every time it's as he's being directed by either the king or his father, he's, being, he's doing what he's being told to do. He doesn't say, hey, I was anointed king. I get to make my own decisions now. No, he follows his father's directives. Notice when he's being told by his dad, I want you to get down there to the battlefront, he doesn't get excited and do exactly what Eliab said, which is just leave the flock wandering around. No, he makes sure the flock is being taken care of by a shepherd and he goes down to the battle. And in fact, when he gets there and the lines are drawn up, David leaves all of the stuff in the charge of someone in their care so it's not left wandering around, all the supplies he's brought, and only then does he go down. We are told several times in ways that David took responsibility, that David was being faithful in what he was called to do. He did not think it was beneath him. He did not think he should just go off to the war, the really important stuff. After all, I'm the king now. No, I may have been anointed king, But my responsibilities at this moment are taking care of a flock. My responsibilities at this moment are taking the supplies that dad is sending down to my brothers and going down there and taking care of them. And when the king calls for me to go into his court, I come in, I play my lyre, I take care of that until I'm called to go back to the flock. David is faithful over and over again in small things. And this is a journey of about 15 miles for a young guy. Now, Now, if any of you have ever raised teenage sons, I'm going to go out on a limb here, they're not the most responsible portion of the human species, okay? 
they sometimes don't do what they're told to do. They sometimes forget things. My dad used to say to me that I would forget my head if it wasn't screwed on because we'd be working on something and he'd send me back to the barn to get some tool and then I would get there and I'd have to holler back, what, what was I supposed to be getting? <laughs> and he'd say, boy, I sent you for one tool and you can't remember what it is. I was fairly typical. David, on the other hand, has to wander 15 miles, not in a car, this is a long, long journey, and he always stays on point. Now, why do I bring this up? This is just a little freebie for you. There are a lot of people today, they read this text, and their takeaway is, I'm going to go out and slay the Goliaths in the world, and I'm going to do it for God. And, and you talk to them, and they're like, I'm doing spiritual warfare against the demons that are ruling over our political system. To which my response is, I think Jesus wants you to get a job Oh, I, I'm going to preach the gospel, and thousands are going to respond. And I say, do you lead your children in devotions? Are you, are you good at that? Oh, Jesus is going to use me to minister to millions. Do you, do you actually do anything with your neighbor? See, we like big battles. We like God's going to use me. But Jesus, Jesus said, if you are faithful in that which is little, you'll be faithful in that which is much. And if you've not been faithful with little, who's going to entrust you with much? And you know what the answer is? Not God. There may be foolish people who will. God will not. And if you don't believe it, look at the landscape of men whose lives are just, the landscape is strewn with destroyed lives because they stepped into responsibilities for which they were not ready. And they weren't ready because they were too busy dreaming of glory rather than taking care of the sheep, rather than doing that which is little. Do not despise small things. They are God's training camp for what he's got for us in the future. So it's a big point with David, and we're going to see it continues for why David is ready to fight Goliath. Fourth thing, because David's been faithful in the small thing, he's been prepared by being a faithful shepherd. If he wasn't out there being a shepherd, he wouldn't have been ready for the battle. Because as Saul tells David, you're not ready, you can't fight this guy. Here's David's response back in verses 34 to 37. David said to Saul, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw, the Hebrew word is hand, the hand of the lion and the hand of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. As a shepherd, David is saying, Saul, I'm a shepherd. God's anointed me to be shepherd over the flock. You don't even know that yet. But I've been out there practicing, doing the little. I've been out there watching over the flock. And you know what? When I was being a shepherd and I am out there, suddenly a lion came up and seized one of the sheep. And I had a choice, Saul, at that moment. I either do what a shepherd's supposed to do and I run to the battle and I risk my life and I fight the lion that has come to destroy God's flock or I sit back and I cower in fear. But here's what I've learned, Saul. When the lion did it and when the bear did it, I went after it, I struck them, and if they were foolish enough to turn around, Yahweh came upon me and I struck them down. And that uncircumcised Philistine who has defied the armies of the living God is nothing but a lion and a bear. But do you see, what if David was asleep while he was being shepherd? He's got no basis to stand before Goliath. What if David had not even been there or if he had cowered in that moment? But see, David has been trained, he has been hardened, he's been prepared for battle by killing dangerous beasts. He was faithful in the small, he's prepared for the big. Now the other thing that goes on here when David brings a story up, it's not just random, how does David strike the lion and the bear? What does a shepherd use as a weapon? A slingshot is what David has used. 
Now, I'm going to put up here a picture of a slingshot for you so you have an idea. It's not the little things that we think of. The leather strap right there is an ancient slingshot, and those stones you are looking at are actually recovered from archaeological digs at Lachish, which is a Jewish city that was conquered. These are Assyrian stones. It was conquered in the reign of Hezekiah. We read about this in Isaiah a few years ago in 701. Those stones weigh about half a pound a piece, and they could actually be hurled up to 200 yards by a skilled, practiced person who is used to using a slingshot, like perhaps a faithful young shepherd boy. And so David has practiced over and over again with these slings. He's become an expert. And then he's been willing to rush in after he's dazed the lion and go in and fight him and kill him by hand if necessary. But none of this is visible to the external eye. You can't see any of it. You just see a young, ruddy boy, and you see a massive, fully armed warrior, battle-hardened. And you think, when I consider height and appearance, this is an obvious choice. Goliath will slay this kid. The people see a boy. God sees through to the heart and sees a shepherd warrior. Very different than what everybody else sees. Now, the last thing then is, or next to last, is David understands this is a spiritual battle. Not only has he been faithful in the small and done all these things, and he's despised very but David understands the nature of the battle, which nobody else out there is doing. Notice what David says in verses 36 and 45 as you go through these speeches, where he says, your servants killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. See, notice he's uncircumcised. He's not part of the covenant people. And what he's doing is it's not about you, Saul. It's not about me. It's not about some other warrior. What it's actually about is he's had the temerity to actually defy the armies of God. He's actually despising and defying Yahweh. And notice in verse 45, which is part of the text we read, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this was David's reaction from the second, the first time he heard Goliath, and everybody else quaked in fear and ran back. That was David's first reaction is, who's this guy? Who does he think he is? Everybody else says, a huge warrior that we're all afraid of. David says, all I see is an uncircumcised Philistine, and he's not shaking his fist in my face. He's shaking his fist in the face of Yahweh. That's all I see. David understands that the battle is actually spiritual. He alone sees the real battle is Yahweh versus Goliath. And so David says, I agree, there's no battle to be had here. Because one of them is much bigger. One of them is much greater. One of them is much better armed. One of them is much stronger. And it's not the puny Philistine you all are looking at. It's Yahweh. That's the nature of the battle that I see. David alone sees outward physical strength and weapons will not determine this conflict. David sees past the outer appearance, the height, the appearance, and sees to the heart of the issue. He's seeing with the eyes of Yahweh. Goliath has defied Yahweh, and Goliath will therefore be struck down by Yahweh. Now, again, step aside for just a second. For you and me, we are so tempted to view life through eyes and outward appearance. But God calls us to see through to the spiritual nature, the spiritual reality that lies behind events. I get so dismayed when I listen to Christians today in quote unquote culture wars and we sound like everybody else. We are just looking at it from politics and from money and from this and that and the other We're like Saul standing in front of Goliath. It's the wrong way. If we don't see through the eyes of God, who will? We we don't live 
by outward physical reality. We live by what's really going on in the heart. And if we view it the way the world does, we would sit there and say, who is this kid thinks he's going to go out and fight this mighty warrior? But that's not the way that God views it. That leads to the last point about David. And that point is, David goes with all of his own weapons and not Saul's. Because here's the next thing that happens. When they finally decide they're going to let David go, they look and they say, okay, you're just this little boy and you're standing there and you got a slingshot and a pouch and nothing else. And this guy, remember all of that armor that was described to us. Well, we got to get you ready. You can't go into battle that way. So notice what we read in verses 38 to 40. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. Now, let me step aside for just a second. How strange is this? He, Saul is putting the king's robe on the one who's been anointed to follow him, which is what Saul should have been doing all along, but Saul doesn't understand what he's doing. So he's putting the tunic on basically to send David out as a sacrificial lamb. What he doesn't realize that he's doing is, oh no, because Yahweh's going to deliver him. <laughs> and after this, he is going to have the king's robe on. That's exactly what's going to happen, Saul. But Saul doesn't quite get that. It's kind of ironic. So then he puts a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. And David fastens on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around. But because he was not used to them, he said, I cannot go in these because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, the shepherd's staff, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Saul's assuming if you're going to go into battle, you need my weapons. I'm looking at this guy. I'm considering his height. I'm considering his appearance. You need some serious armor on because this guy is impressive and strong. David says you're looking at the battle the wrong way. I don't need any of this stuff. None of your weapons, none of your armor is appropriate for the battle because it's designed for a different kind of battle. This is Yahweh's battle, and he's not going to send me in with all of that stuff. So David goes into battle without sword, without shield, without spear. This is part of why Michelangelo has him naked. As it were, he's walking in naked. Nothing. He's standing there, and to the outward eye, you not only see a huge, giant-like figure, he is armed to the teeth with every implement of modern weaponry, both offensive and defensive, and he's even got a shield bearer with him. And from the other side strides out a young lad, unimpressive to external appearance and appearing to have nothing in the way of armor. This is the preparation for battle. Now, if we're sitting there looking, who, who do you think is going to win that? I mean, it looks like Goliath. All he's got, David, is a shepherd's bag, a sling, and some stones. Now, the interesting thing is we turn to the battle, and it begins the way we would expect, which is Goliath starts taunting David in verses 43 and 44. He spits out at David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Notice the spiritual nature of the battle. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and beasts of the field. So Goliath, fully armed, experienced in warfare, looks down, he sees a young lad, seemingly naked of arm, uh, arms. Now, what's interesting is if Goliath is nine and a half feet tall, one of the problems that usually afflicts people that have giantism, where they grow really, really large, is they usually have very poor eyesight, in which case Goliath doesn't even realize, well, he may appear to be naked, but he does have that sling. <laughs> and those slings can do some serious damage. So if he is really tall, he doesn't, what's really clear is either way, Goliath does not understand what's about to happen. He boasts and he taunts. His, this was called flighting in the ancient world. Uh, it's what we call trash talk today. He's trash talking David to instill fear. And notice he curses David by his gods and says, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to feed you to the animals because my God and, the, and one of the chief Philistine gods was known as Dagon. We're going to come back to him in just a minute. And he's basically saying, Dagon is going to cause me to overcome you, and I'm going to crush you and feed you to the animals. But David then responds in verses 45 to 47. And notice, he doesn't respond to physical taunts the way that, that most people would. He responds with spiritual truth. He says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Look, I, Saul tried to get me to bring out sword and spear and javelin. That's not the way I came. 
because this is Yahweh's battle. David does not consider his height or his appearance. He sees through to the heart of the matter. And notice he says a couple of times in here, God's, the Lord's going to hand you over to me, and I'm going to strike you down. It's not about the weaponry you've got, because you've got sword, you've got spear, you've got javelin, but guess what? They don't strike at Yahweh. You can throw your spear and your javelin all day long. They will not strike Yahweh. But he will use me as his tool, and you will be struck down. And in fact, Goliath, I'm telling you now, I will strike you down, and then I'm going to come over there, and because I didn't bring my own sword into battle, I'm going to have to borrow yours for a minute, and I'm going to chop your head off. And then I'm going to hold it up and look at the rest of the army, and then we're going to strike every one of them down. That's what's going to happen in this battle, Goliath. Nothing but the look of confidence that Michelangelo so well captured. Now, the interesting thing is, huge buildup here. We're 47 verses in, and this is like Jesus standing at the tomb of Lazarus. We are not going to get the long, if this was a Hollywood movie, we'd have another 35 minutes of teaching coming up. But we don't, because we're not going to get all kinds of special effects. That's why Hollywood probably doesn't want to make this movie, because when you get to the actual battle, there's not a whole lot of special effects needed. Because what happens is Goliath starts running towards David in verse 48. He moves closer to attack him. David doesn't get why. He just starts running towards Goliath. He reaches in the bag. He grabs a stone. He twirls it around. He hurls it. There's actually a picture I couldn't find where the hand of God guides the stone. And it runs right to Goliath's head. And it smacks him in the forehead. And it strikes him. And Goliath falls down. The battle is short. There's a... 47 verses preparing for it, and then in a verse, it's over. Because the point is, Goliath's not a match for Yahweh. This is not hard. God's not breaking a sweat. And notice, we're told it's the stone strikes Goliath in the head, and the forehead. It sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Now, we might expect that if you get a stone hurled from, say, 50 yards away, and it's coming with all that force and hits you in the forehead, which way would you normally fall? backwards. But here's why he fell face forward. If you remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 5, when the Philistines won a battle and they captured the Ark of the Covenant and they carried it in before Dagon, the one that that Goliath had just referred to, they carried it before Dagon and they put it there and they said, Dagon has conquered Yahweh. And Yahweh said, really? Because the next morning they came in and Dagon had fallen face forward and laid in his face on the dust. So they set Dagon back up, and the next morning they came in, and Dagon had fallen down, and his head had snapped off. And so David comes up and says, you think Dagon's something? He does him, and he watches him fall, and he remembers the story. And David runs up, he grabs the sword, he chops his head off, and said, battle over. All done, in a moment, because it's not about me and Goliath. It's about Yahweh and Dagon, and there is no battle. And Dagon chose his champion, and he chose him by height, and he chose him by appearance, and he was impressive, and he was armed to the teeth, and I strode out here naked. A young boy, no match for him, but I cut his head off, and I won because Yahweh is my God. That is what's going on in the battle here. Now, the aftermath then and then we'll go to applying the word. The aftermath is David does this, and of course the Philistines look, and if you're a Philistine, what do you think? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. We didn't think anybody could beat this guy, and not only did somebody beat him, it wasn't even a battle. I was turning around getting soda (laughs) for the concessions, and the whole thing was over. I mean, how did this happen? It can't be possible. But it's exactly what happens. So the Philistines run, and suddenly Israel finds their courage, and they pursue the Philistines all the way back to their village. They strike a bunch of them, and then they come back, and they plunder the camp. The Philistines flee. Israel routs them, and Israel receives the spoils of David's victory. David, the anointed, fights. Israel gets the spoils. Keep that in mind. Yes, we're going to come back to that. It's about who does the fighting and who gets the spoils. And I have a bit of good news for you. You don't do the fighting. You're not David. Jesus is David. You're Israel, and so am I, and we get the spoils. But we'll come back to that in just a second. So 
How do we apply this? What does this mean for us? And this is where it's so important. Do we see David's true greatness? Here's how I usually hear this taught. David had five smooth stones. Here's five smooth stones for the Goliaths in your life. And I want to beat my head to a pulp when I hear that. That's completely misusing the biblical text. It's highly allegorical, and it has nothing to do with what's going on in the story here. That's not what we are to learn from David. It misunderstands what's being taught. David doesn't conquer because he had the right stones or the right ones. The, the text tells us David conquered and slew the giant without a sword, without a spear, without a javelin, without a shield. He conquered Goliath. The point's not that he used the slingshot. He did all that. It's that he strode into battle naked. David won because he was anointed of the Spirit by Yahweh, not because of external things. David conquered because he had learned to trust Yahweh in smaller battles. David uh, conquered because he didn't look on outward appearances, but went through and saw to the heart of the matter, which was a spiritual battle. If you're going to learn anything from David in this text, and this is only a minor point, here's what you and I need to learn. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, be faithful in small things, look past outward appearances, and see the spiritual battle. Nobody wants to buy books when I say that because that means get up tomorrow, go to work, be a good employee, and be calling out to God every day to be formed and fashioned by the Holy Spirit. But we want five smooth stones. We want principles so I can conquer. But see, we're interested in those kinds of things. We want techniques for quick victory. God works through long, painful processes to transform us into the kind of people he desires. David didn't have techniques. He sat on a hillside, faithfully shepherding a flock, doing what he was called to do, and when the moment came, Yahweh plucked him out and said, I can use you because I have formed and fashioned you long and painfully to be who I want you to be. But we want techniques. Brothers and sisters, there is no technique. If you stand before Goliath with the technique, you'll be slain in short order. That's the only lesson you can learn from David if you're going to do it. So are we learning to see things the way God does or to trust him? But that's a minor point. Let me get the real question. Do you see that Christ has conquered for us? Again, you're not David in this text, nor am I. David is the anointed one the Mashiach, the Messiah, the first of many of these who is going to come to deliver the people of God, culminating in the true anointed one, the true Mashiach, the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the unimpressive one. Remember last week we looked and saw in Isaiah, nobody looked at him and thought anything about him. There's nothing outwardly that would make us be drawn to him, but God had anointed him with the Holy Spirit. And as unimpressive as he was to us, he wins the greatest battle ever. Jesus is the one who is anointed with the Holy Spirit and slays the enemy for you and I. He is the faithful shepherd who delivers us from the mouth of the lion who prowls to destroy you and me. And friend, you don't need five smooth stones and techniques when the lion prowls to come get you. On that day when he roars and he stands there, all the techniques and the self-help stuff you've learned is going to fade away. And you better hope that you know that you don't have to fear because your Messiah, your anointed one, will come out and strike the lion down and deliver you from his mouth. That's the lesson we are to learn. Jesus is the warrior who has conquered Satan. He has conquered death. He has held them high. He has made a public spectacle of them and then looks to you and me and says, you are free. And all the spoils of victory are yours. That's what God calls us to grasp and see. He has routed the enemies of God, and we receive the spoils of victory. So much so that Paul quotes a prophet and says, we can say, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, grave, where is your sting? Because the greatest thing you are going to face is not a really large warrior. 
arrayed impressively. It's not ISIS. It's not the opposing political party. It's not a family member or a neighbor you don't like. It's the day death comes and it reaches its icy grip out to grab you. And on that day, there is only one way to have spoil of victory. And that's when Jesus comes and slaps that hand away and says, I have died and been raised for that one. He is mine. That is the ultimate battle, friend. And that one, there is nobody can win for us other than Jesus. Even David died, as Peter tells us, and his tomb was there a thousand years later. But the anointed one, the Messiah, conquered death. And he did it for you and for me. Do we see that in this text? I want to encourage you today, whatever you face, whatever you face, you have a victorious, conquering, shepherd, warrior, king who stands before you, who has gone all the way through death. And notice when he went into that battle with death, what does he come out with? I have the keys of death and hell in my hands. And you are free. And so we can stand not bound up by the things that cause fear and quaking to the rest of the world. Because if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Let's stand together. We're going to come to Christ, our shepherd, warrior, king, in prayer. And then we'll go forth with a word of benediction. I encourage you to cry out to him. And I encourage you, if there are things as great as death or lesser, I want to encourage you to look to Christ to be your deliverer. Father, when we consider the story, what an amazing story and moment it must have been. Lord, of many moments in Scripture, I'd have loved to have been there and seen to see young David bristling with faith in that moment because you had so worked in his life. Lord, it must have been amazing. But even more amazing, Lord, is to realize that to which it points forward. That Lord Jesus, you are the one everyone considered unimpressive. And you are the one who ran to the battle for us. And you are the one who, unlike David, didn't run out and appear to win immediately. You even allowed the enemy to rush upon you. And you swallowed death itself and overcame it by your indestructible life. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would open our eyes. As we began singing this morning, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. I pray that this week we would see not height and appearance and things all around us, but we would see through to you, Jesus. Give us eyes to see as you see. And Lord, most importantly, let us see that there is no enemy we will face. There is nothing, including death itself, over which you do not have sovereign control. There is not one square inch of this universe over which you do not stand and victoriously shout, that is mine. And Lord, we are but your humble servants. And Father, I pray as Israel entered into the spoils of David's victory that day, Lord, I pray we would live as those who live by the spoils you have given us from your victory. We are told, Lord Jesus, that when you had descended down and then you burst forth and you came up, that you gave gifts to men. You you led us in your victory train and you distributed gifts among us. Lord, you are the conquering general and we are the grateful recipients of all of the, the gifts of your victory. Father, I pray that no one here would live by our own paltry resources. I pray rather we would live in the victory you have given to us for your glory. I pray our heart would be as David's was, that we would say this day it will be known there is a God and he has 
delivered. Father, that is our prayer. That is our cry. That is our longing. I pray again, Lord, the same Holy Spirit who rushed upon David in power. Send your Holy Spirit to rush upon us that we might behold Jesus, that we might be filled with faith, and Lord, that we would walk after Jesus, enjoying the spoils of the victory he gives to us. We ask that you would do this in his name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do a little bit different benediction today. This is going to be from Hebrews chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 1. I'm paraphrasing it a bit, but I encourage you to receive some of the spoils that Jesus has given to you. May Christ, who by his death and resurrection has destroyed the devil's power and now holds the keys of death and hell, may he free you from all your enemies so that you might live in the blessings of the children of God until he takes you home. In Jesus' name, go forth in peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.